Good afternoon. Um, I'm delighted to have been given this opportunity to speak to you today about our significant new acquisition for Kelmscott Manor, and um, one which I'm sure will prove one of the highlights um, of the collections there. It has been made possible not only because of generous contributions from individuals, but also through funding from the National Heritage Memorial Fund and the V&A Purchase Grant Fund. Those of you who came to Fellows Day at the Manor earlier on in the year will already have seen it in situ there. As Jill said, you can see it um, after these talks upstairs in the library. And it's this piece, The Homestead and the Forest Cot Quilt, designed by Mae Morris, William Morris's younger daughter, and embroidered by her mother Jane. It was in June 2014 that we were first made aware of this object by a fellow member of the William Morris Network, which is an informal network of heritage professionals, volunteers and friends organisations from the various Morris-related museums and historic houses across the UK. Clearly it had great resonance for the manor and it was an item which we were immediately keen to acquire. Well, we have of course been researching it since then and I'd just like to mention three people in particular who've contributed to what we now know about it. The first is Dr. Lynn Hulse, a fellow of the Society, um, embroidery historian and practitioner who very kindly supplied us with um, a technical report on the stitching of the piece. The second is Linda Parry, whose name I'm sure is familiar to a lot of you, um, the preeminent expert in Morris textiles, who wrote a compelling statement and acquisition of the piece. And finally, Jill Halliwell, who is a member of the volunteer research group at the Manor, who have done so much to support us in researching discrete aspects of the history of the manor, its collections, and the people associated with it in the two years since it first started. Well, the quilt itself um, is just over four feet by five. It's embroidered in silk thread on a silk ground, backed with indigo dyed cotton cloth, and bearing the handwritten exhibition label to the reverse, which you can see here. The design incorporates a stylized representation, or perhaps it might be fairer to say an evocation, of Kelmscott Manor, surrounded by domestic and farm animals, uh, with a garden and an orchard, a place of domesticity, order and productivity, harboured within the encircling Thames, and as I'm sure you all know, the River Thames is just 300 yards away from the manor. Beyond Birds and beasts of the wider world abound, and I've selected just a few of them to show you here. Um, we like to think that perhaps one of them is even a wombat, and it's the little fellow with his back to you. Um, the wombat was a beast that um, pre-Raphaelite poet, painter, Dante Gabriel Rossetti was particularly fond of. Um, and May Morris was, in her turn, very close to Rossetti in the years of her girlhood. She spent a great deal of time with him at Kelmscott when he was joint tenant at the manor between 1871 and 74. So we're aware there might be a little of element of doubt there, but we like to think that's a wombat. <laughs> um, the quilt's border incorporates 12 quotations and proverbs, which I'll come back to in a couple of minutes. Well, it's an exceptional example of the collaborative work of Jane and Mae Morris, who, although considered more generally in relation to William Morris, were both highly gifted in their own right. Mae was not only an extremely talented embroideress, but she was a gifted designer as well. And when she was just 23, she was appointed um, director of the embroidery department at Morris & Co. in 1885, a post which she held for 11 years until the year of her father's death in 1896. And under her leadership, the department executed some of the finest embroidered work of the day, amongst which can be numbered the hangings from the bed at Kelmscott Manor. She also um, was very active in the Royal School of Needlework, and over the years she developed a particular expertise in historical embroidery, particularly Opus Anglicanum, and uh, both lectured and wrote widely on the subject. And in 1893, her book, Decorative Needlework, was published, which was um, ostensibly a practical guide to stitching, but which was framed by an introductory chapter devoted to the discussion of historical styles of needlework, and which urged the reader to look back to the Middle Ages for inspiration. Well, in her turn, Jane Morris was extremely talented 
in transcribing designs into finished embroidery, something which she was well versed in doing, particularly during the early years of her marriage to William Morris, um, when the family lived at Red House, and when embroidered panels and hangings such as these, the daisy hangings, which again are in the Kelmscott Manor collection, was so prominent um, within the uh, decorative schemes of the house. And in Linda Parry's opinion, her transcription of May Morris's design to the finished piece that you'll see today was a masterpiece in its application of technique in retaining May's own drawing style, something very difficult to achieve. So what do we know about the history and significance of this object? Well, the ledger of um, the embroidery department at um, Fort Morrison Company is now at the National Art Library at the V&A. And what that tells us is that uh, May designed a great many things um, over the years that she was director of that department, but only a handful of cot quilts are listed um, as being pieces for <coughs> retail um, or, or commissioned. Um, and only one of those is described as having animals as its subject matter, a commission from Mrs. Whiteley in 1893. May does appear to have designed another rather more simplified version of our cot quilt in 1889 for an American client, which is described as having a small house surrounded by animals and birds, and um, above which hover an American eagle, which may quite possibly bear some relation to the eagle which is featured at the top of uh, the design of our cot quilt, this piece, unfortunately, um, has since been lost, or at least its whereabouts are currently unknown, so it's not been av available to us for comparative purposes. But what is evident is that such subject matter was extremely rare within May's oeuvre. Well, in 1890, the cot quilt was one of nine pieces designed by May Morris to be included in the third Arts and Crafts Exhibition Society show. And um, it was identifiable from its catalogue description. And the exhibition itself was reviewed in the Illustrated London News. And the quilt was given a particular mention, praising both the complexity and originality of its design. And I'll just read you an extract from that review. In a glass case is arranged a cot quilt, designed by Miss Morris and worked by Mrs. Morris, with a goodly array of animals, bordered with lines from Tiger Tiger Burning Bright by William Blake, Perhaps of all the pieces contributed by the Morris family, this is one of the best and most original. Well, another hundred years went by before the piece was shown in public again, when it featured in the exhibition held at the William Morris Gallery in 1989, which was in fact the first exhibition to be devoted purely to May Morris and her work. And the catalogue for that show described it as being amongst the most important works featured. So the design of this exceptional piece can safely be said to date to 1889, or possibly the early months of 1890, the months immediately preceding May's marriage to fellow socialist Henry Halliday Sparling, who you can see seated next to May in this photograph with Emery Walker and George Bernard Shaw. Um, William Morris, as I'm sure you know, was a committed revolutionary socialist from 1883, and his daughter shared his political convictions as did Sparling. Prior to her marriage, May spent extended amounts of time at Kelmscott Manor preparing for her new life, and we know this from her mother's correspondence. Um, Jane, in writing to a friend, observes, May is away at Kelmscott Manor alone, learning cooking and how to live on a few shillings a week. And perhaps not surprisingly, given May's affection for the place, they then spent their honeymoon at the manor. Well, given that this was a transitionary period in May's life, it is pertinent to question, as Linda Parry has done, whether the quilt's childlike composition could simply be said to be a flight of May's imagination, or whether instead it reflects a newly awakened maternal awareness. And Fiona McCarthy, in her authoritative biography of William Morris, gives weight to this possibility when she observes that although there doesn't appear to be any surviving evidence, um, it is maintained within Morris circles that the Sparlings had a stillborn child. And although we quite possibly will never know whether our quilt is the quilt designed by May for her own lost child, what we do know is that it had immense personal significance for her, which is demonstrated by an account from the 1920s. It was in March 1925 that Elfrida Manning, daughter of the sculptor Hamo Thornycroft, 
visited Kelmscott Manor, and she recorded that visit in her diary. It was then published in 1980 in the Journal of the William Morris Society, and very usefully from our perspective, she is careful to, to state that the diary entry was made at the time of her visit to the manor rather than retrospectively. So as well as being a highly detailed account of her visit, it's also a very reliable one. And she describes taking tea with May Morris prior to then detailing the embroideries which had been selected for her by May to view. And I'll read you the pertinent extract. Miss Morris showed us some coverlets embroidered with silk, a charming one for a child with a little house, a river, and every kind of animal. Foxes, ducks, a smiling lion, and a wheat kneed elephant, etc. And round them was a border of mottoes. First plough your furrow, then God will send the seed. Better unborn than untaught, and an Italian one, and a Persian one. So a very detailed description of the piece. In addition, on that visit, she was shown a pair of bishop's gloves, finely embroidered by May Morris to a design by Charles Ricketts. Those are now in the V&A. And another bed cover, which was embroidered with honeysuckle, fritillaries, and crown imperial, which, as she noted, were flowers which flourished in the fields around Kelmscott at that date. Evidently, these were particularly precious items to her. She had a house full of uh, wonderful items which she could have chosen to show her guests, but these were the pieces that she selected. And our cot quilt embodies that very deep affection felt by May for Kelmscott, our beloved Oxfordshire home, as she called it, the place that was a constant in her life from the age of nine, and which she felt to be her true home. She was to write, Though my family lived ostensibly in London, we were never really town birds. Country life was always to us the natural and happy thing. And from 1923, May made the manor her permanent home when she left her house at Hammersmith Terrace behind. Well, I'm just going to say a few quick words about the pictorial and textual content of the piece before I conclude. Um, as I said before, research is still ongoing into it. Um, and particularly into the rationale behind May's choices, both in terms of the animals and beasts which she included in the design and the quotations and proverbs. Stylistically, the anthropomorphised smiling lion, as Elfrida Manning called him, who you can see on the left here, obviously references uh, 17th century stump work. We don't know whether she was referencing one particular piece or not, but for some of the other um, birds and beasts, we do have far more specific sources that have been identified. So here we have the heron. Uh, the top left image is the heron from the cot cover, and beneath it is another heron designed by May Morris some 20 years later for the coverlet that she de designed for her mother to embroider in memory of her father, and which remains at the manor today. On the right, we have uh, Thomas Buick's illustration from A History of British Birds, Volume 2, first published in 1804, and of which William Morris owned a copy of the first edition, to which, of course, May would have had ready access. Likewise, the spotted giraffe, or camel leopard, as it's termed um, in this particular source, and the Ganges stag, appear to have been adapted from illustrations in Ralph Bealby's General History of Quadrupeds, first published in 1791, and of which Morris owned a copy of the second edition. And if I just go back a second to the giraffe, what's quite interesting is that the illustration that you see here is from that second edition. And as you can see, although it is um, slightly simplified, the embroidered design shows a spotted animal. In later editions of that book, that the pattern on the animal's skin is rather more jigsaw-like, as one would expect. So there's clearly um, a close correlation between May's design and that of the edition owned by her father. It's no coincidence that these creatures, and quite possibly many of the others, can be linked to volumes held in Morris's library, a ready and available source of inspiration to May, who certainly appears to have made extensive use of it. The quotations and proverbs that she selected with which to decorate the border of the piece are also noteworthy. Many of them are bound by a common philosophy, living responsibly, taking advantage of opportunities for education and self-improvement, 
and dealing fairly and kindly with one's fellow man, all broadly speaking tenets of socialism and reflective of May's political activism through her involvement with the Hammersmith branch of the Socialist League at this time. And if I just look a little closer at the first one, Better Unborn Than Untaught is taken from Plato's Republic. The full line from that is, it is better to be unborn than untaught, for ignorance is the root of misfortune. And perhaps more specifically, given the date at which May was designing this piece, it may also be worth considering the possibility that she was making an oblique reference to her father's great utopian novel, News From Nowhere, which was first published in serial form in the socialist journal Commonweal from January 1890. The two other um, proverbs beneath that reflect those same socialist values. And it does appear that May also referenced directly her father's work. The two extracts of Farsi, which you can see here, have been identified as coming from the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, a poem for which Morris had a particular enthusiasm, and um, of which he had created two illuminated manuscript versions in the 1870s, which of course May would have been aware of. In fact, the ongoing research by American scholars, <coughs> William and Sylvia Peterson, into reconstructing William Morris's personal library, and they visited the manor this summer to look at our books for that particular project, has made it possible for us to establish that with the exception of William Blake's Songs of Innocence and Experience, which of course relate to the Tiger Tiger Burning Bright line, all of the um, quotations and proverbs are taken from books owned by Morris. And so it can be seen that the quilt not only encapsulates May's creative collaboration with her mother, but also reflects the intellectual and political bond between herself and her father. Well, it remained in May's hands until her death, and subsequently was entered into the rather forlorn sale that took place on a rainy day in July 1939, and um, in which it was described in the catalogue rather perfunctorily as embroidered cot quilt worked by Mrs. William Morris. We know from annotated copies of that catalogue that the purchaser was one Mrs. May Elliot Hobbs of Bradshaw's Farm, Kelmscott, and that she paid £26 for it. And May Elliot Hobbs is herself rather an interesting person. She was the daughter of a noted Scottish agriculturalist and stock breeder. Born in 1872, she was privately educated and then she went to Germany to study the piano before embarking on a career as a concert pianist, cut short in 1906 by her marriage to Robert Hobbs, who was a farmer at Kelmscott and breeder of the renowned herd of Kelmscott shorthorn cattle, which I believe Jenny may mention again in her talk, who also was the Morris's landlord at Kelmscott at that date. Evidently, May Elliot Hobbs was uh, very independently minded. She supported women's suffrage. She also served in the First World War with an ambulance unit in France and subsequently was in the Women's Land Army. But as well as that, she had a particular love for and deep knowledge of rural life. And um, she was, along with Cecil Sharp, with whom you can see her photograph here, Cecil Sharp on the left, an aged Morris dancer to his right, May Elliot Hobbs, and then we have May Morris, and in the wheelchair, uh, the rather um, dark figure is Jane Morris. This image was taken just two years before Jane Morris's death. Um, she was a founder member of the English Folk Dance Society. And May Elliot Hobbs, um, in her 40s, embarked on a lecture tour of America. This is one of the pages taken from the prospectus for that tour during which she spoke on farming, English folk dance and song, and of course, inevitably, Kelmscott. So it can be seen that she was in sympathy with many of May Morris's own concerns, and the two women became friends. They were both particularly interested in the role of women in rural society, and they were the driving force behind the foundation of Kelmscott's Women in Women's Institute in 1916. And for many years thereafter, they were also at the heart of the social life of the village, initiating, encouraging, participating in, and of course hosting communal activities. Well, May Elliot Hobbs um, retained the cock quilt until her death. It then passed down through the family 
until um, it was acquired literally just a few weeks ago by the Society. So we have an unbroken uh, provenance for the piece. I'm just going to finish by um, saying a few words about how the quilt will now augment the collections at the manor. Firstly, it is of course um, a creative response to the inspirational power of the manor, its history and significance, exploring which is at the heart of our future vision for the site. It also draws together the Hobbs and Morris families and the link between the manor and its history as a working farm. The manor was of course built by the antecedents of the Hobbs family, the Turners, and during both the, the tenure and the ownership of the manor itself by the Morris family, the adjacent farm buildings were still used for agricultural purposes, embodying the continuity of this isolated community, which was of such immense importance to William Morris, and which we plan to incorporate into our future interpretation. The piece will provide an imaginative entree into the collections for our younger visitors. We have struggled slightly to achieve that and this is an ideal piece to assist us in doing so and we'll be developing interpretation accordingly. And last but not least, we hope to capitalise on the appeal of this delightful piece by developing and licensing retail products based on it, which will, we hope, make a practical contribution to safeguarding Kells Cot Manor's future. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Um, yes, yeah, so I worked, um, my internship was about seven weeks long and I spent two weeks here at the Magna Carta exhibition and then I spent about five weeks in Kelmscott over the summer. Um, and when we arrived, we weren't, we weren't really sure what to expect, um, but I think both of us realised over the course of the internship that there is so much at Kelmscott to do and there's so much, um, such a depth of interesting history to look at. Um, and we both really enjoyed our time there. So I'm going to start um, just with a brief overview of some of the um, tasks that we were given um, to have a look at. Um, and uh, Jen will be speaking later about the uh, Turner and Hobbs families. Um, and we spent like, quite a lot of time looking at um, them. And we really dabbled in all these areas. Um, but I'm going to be talking about mapping Camscott Manor's interiors and their, their outside and gardens. Um, and also, we spent we also mucked in with the day to day running of the manor on the open days, um, doing stewarding on the ticket office, and all that thing, all these things. So, a lot of the mapping of the interior and exterior of the manor really took um, shape in the form of image research. Um, so, this house, the manor, has been lived in for hundreds of years. Um, and the Morrises, you know, they are really only a small fraction of the people who have lived there. Um, and one of the things that can be considered when looking at the manor is what part of this time do we present to the public and how much, um, how much information can we give about the people that have lived here and the history of the house itself. Um, even within the period of the manor, um, as Cathy was saying, May Morris considered it as her home as she lived there for a very long time. Um, and using images to track changes um, in the interior and exterior of the manor um, can be very helpful in explaining this, um, this kind of period of people living in the house to visitors. Um, and it can also influence um, the layout of the house, what furniture we have where, and how it's actually presented. So this is an example of the kind of um, issues that can come up when looking at image research. So we have three different images here from different points um, in the manor. So we've got an image um, from the Frederick Evans collection um, from 1896 of, of the White Room. And then we have one that's undated, but this is of May Morris in the White Room. And then one from 1921, which is later, um, from Country Life. And really what's interesting here is that in the middle picture, you can see that the Red House Settle um, is in the white room, along with uh, a big round oak table which is being used as a work table. None of these things are in the white room at the moment. Um, here it's being used perhaps as a work room, as a living room, um, and now it's uh, a lot more formal um, in the way it's presented. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see how the use of the room might have changed through the years. 
um, and why we might, and why is the red satyr now in the garden hall, and things like that. And it's great to be able to perhaps offer these images to visitors um, to show the kind of um, development of the house. Um, but this image is an example of how frustrating this kind of work can be. Um, as this image we found um, on a piece of paper um, in some of the files, and we're not sure where this is from. We're not sure what data it is. We're not really sure who that woman is in the corner. Um, and it kind of shows that it, it can be, some images can be quite limiting um, and quite frustrating when you can't slot them nicely into the time frame. Um, so I'm not going to take you through the hundreds of images that we uh, found, um, but I do want to say that approaching this task, we weren't approaching a blank canvas. The previous interns, staff members and the wonderful volunteer group um, that Cathy mentioned earlier had already done quite a lot of work on this but the problem was that there were a lot of images but they weren't in the same place they weren't referenced some were digital files some were physical files and that really what I spent a lot of time doing when I was at Calmscott is collating all these images making sure that we had both a physical and digital file of each one and trying to find out as much as possible about each image um, and the provenance um, of it. So this is a screenshot from a very large spreadsheet that we've put together um, with as much information as we could get about each different image and hopefully this will be really useful for people to come back to um, in the future so they can easily trace the images um, and make them actually usable in the manner. So I'm just going to give some examples of things we found and why they might be useful. So. Uh, one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing was uh, trawling through some of the Camscott Manor archives, um, which contain a lot of correspondence um, over the last 50 years. Um, and some of the things in there we've now become unaware of because they um, weren't kept track of. So this is an example of some of the bits and bobs we found. This is photocopies of sketches um, dated to 1889 of the outside of the manor from the Middleton notebooks. And then here we have uh, two maps of the uh, floor plans of the manor that are dated to 1889 and 1895. I've just circled kind of points of interest which might be useful when trying to explain things to visitors. So for example, on the map floor plan on the left, you can see that the two rooms um, on, the, on the edge of the house um, which they are both shut off. So, but now um, the white room, which at the top, we still have that little closet room. Um, but in the green room at the bottom, that's now all one room. It's been knocked through. So, it, it, it's uh, yeah. So it's interesting to see for visitors that the house has not always looked the way it does now. On the right, we've got a floor plan with. Um, a uh, photogra photocopy of a floor plan which has uh, Philip Webb and William Morris's handwriting on and they're discussing uh, changes they might want to make to the manor. So the, the bit that I've circled says, um, I want this room which is now tiled with machine made tiles to be flagged. So it's quite a nice glimpse into the way that um, the Morrises viewed the house and changes they'd want to make to it. Um, yeah, so another, another kind of um, source we used for images was a lot of internet collection searching. This is just some example of images we found on the National Portrait Gallery collections. And um, these are primarily of uh, Mae Morris during her time at Calm Scott. Um, so yeah, we've got her in the garden. Um, the third picture in the middle is her using a loom in the green room. Again, a great example of how the house might have been used. Um, very much a working house, very much very productive, um, which you might not get a sense of that now. It's very peaceful, it's very calm. Um, but it was very much a workhouse. Um, and the, the three pictures that are outlined in red are just an um, example of these are new images that we came across this year. Um, that were not part of the collection of images already held. Uh, so the Scott Snells um, lived at, rented the manor in the 1940s 
and um, their son, Jocelyn Goodwin, has recently um, discovered a lot of their correspondence and a lot of his father's artwork, and he's actually published a book recently which covers the Scott Snell's time at the manor. And these are sketches by Edwin Scott Snell, um, which I think are really interesting because I think they show a different kind of artistic conception of what the manor is, um, especially this picture on the right, which is almost threatening in a way, which is definitely not a feeling I think a lot of people get when they visit the manor. But again, it's an interesting, a different view of the manor and how people might have um, lived in it. This next picture is a sketch by Edwin Scott Snell of his wife Stephanie during their time at the manor. And yes, the observant amongst you might notice that the sofa that she's sitting on is uh, the settle that can be found outside um, in the hall, which obviously was at the manor during the 1940s. And uh, the details are very similar indeed. Um, so in terms of different uses of the manor, this image is, like it says, from an edition of the City of Oxford High School magazine, um, and it's taken on a school trip to Calmscott um, at that time, um, where the boys learnt about um, farming and such like. So I, I think this is probably the teachers. <laughs> but, um, another source of images are Miss Love's scrapbooks. Miss Love was um, a very close friend and companion of um, May Morris when May was living at the manor permanently. And her, a big stack of her scrapbooks has recently been discovered at the National Library of Wales, where a lot of work is going into them at the moment. Um, but there are lots of images of the outside of the manor, <coughs> which can be found here. And these are really useful when trying to reconstruct what the manor looked like, especially when putting together things for the HLF bids and things like that, and thinking about the, the manor as a working farm and how long that went on for. And one of the things that we did, as well as image research, was we looked out for passages of writing and descriptions that describe the inside and the outside of the house at various points. And this is a letter from Jane Morris to Philip Worth, um, discussing and um, tiling the fireplace. As you see, she's very specific. I've only <coughs> selected an extract from this letter. It goes on for quite some time, uh, talking about different, um, different types of tiles and what Morris himself might like. Um, uh, but this is a slightly different view of the manor from a visitor in um, 1896. <coughs> And though she does say the house is lovely for its oldness, she is quite rude about uh, Jane Morris. And the, it reminds us that when the Morrises used this house as a young couple, they, they did look, there's a phrase Jane says that they were picnicking in the house. They really, it wasn't their, their home, it was very sparse. Um, and I think it's, it's nice to, to see this kind of view of what the house was like when they were living in it. Obviously, a woman of no reputation without her stays. And um, this is an extract from uh, a piece written by Felix, um, who is the other son of the Scott Snells, um, who actually lived in the manor with his parents. They ran a small school there for a bit. Very interesting people. Um, but again, this is fascinating, living there during the war, um, and he says, uh, Calmscott Manor did have gas masks hanging ready in the hallway, but had no telephone and no radio. Um, and that's a hangover from May Morris, who didn't want to install electricity at the manor. And he goes on to talk about how they had ducks and chickens for eggs, um, and they had a beehive that yielded honey as an alternative to sugar, which was rationed. Uh, they bought a milk cow and named her Amaryllis after a Greek legend. And that's lovely because I think it tells you a lot about the family, but also that it was still being used as a farm. It was very much a country house, um, even this late on. This is a wonderful description of people attempting to visit the manor during the Scott Snells and um, time there. He's quite rude about the Scott Snells. Um, they are artists, dreadful artists. These hideous watercolours were hung on top of Morris's hangings and tapestries. Um, apparently the Scots Nels made it quite difficult to people, for people to visit, um, but that was part of the terms of their renting the manor, was that um, people were allowed to visit and view Morris's um, works. It's fascinating to think that all Morris's tapestries, a lot of 
the bed hangings, the embroidery were just out um, and being used as part of a family home. Um, so other documents we looked at, we looked at um, legal documents. This is the will and codicil of Miss Mary, Mary Morris, that's May Morris. Um, and this is lovely when she mentions certain things being kept in certain rooms. And we can see um, how furniture moved around the house. So here we have to her goddaughter she leaves her Japanese cabinets, which are in her bedroom. Whereas in the Frederick Evans photograph of the White Room from 1896, you can see the Japanese cabinet there. Um, and that's, I think that's where they still are in the house. Um, obviously, that's 40 years previously, so it reminds us that it's, it's a real house and things aren't just left in status. Again, this is a description from the contents of Carl Scott Manor um, that May wrote. Um, and all these, all these items are things that were in what was called the passage room, which is now the Marigold room. The Marigold room formed part of the flat um, that was lived in by um, those looking after the manor um, around the 60s, which is now um, uh, an exhibition space. We used it when we were working at the manor. It's very modernised and pretty much empty apart from a few trestle tables. And there are all these items that would have been in there. And what I think this reminds us is that uh, the Calmscott Manor was really a living house and the image, re the image research we've done and all, all the um, documents we've looked at uh, show a, an ordinary house where objects move from room to room and I think the next thing to do with all this information is to decide what to do with it and how much, uh, what period of time do you want to present and how do we kind of organise this information in a way that's useful for visitors. So all I want to do is say thank you so much to um, Cathy and Sarah and the rest of the staff at Camscott for having me with them over the summer. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, uh, my name's Jenny. Um, as John mentioned, I came to Camscott shortly after completing my Masters in Art History at Oxford. I stayed a little longer than Olivia. I was there for ten weeks. Um, so, okay. So much of the focus at Kelmscott Manor understandably centres on William Morris. Um, Morris took the tenancy of Kelmscott in 1874, but it's a 16th century manor house. Um, the property has a history stretching back for nearly three centuries prior to the no, state. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, as a 16th century manor house, uh, Kelmscott has a history stretching back nearly three centuries prior to, to William Morris. Um, throughout this period, it was occupied continuously by the same family who built it, the Turner family, a local family of farmers who became minor gentry uh, when they were granted arms in 1665. In the 19th century, the Turners married into the Hobbs family, who were also local farmers. The Hobbs family continued to work the farm buildings even after the manor had been leased to Morris, right until the farm eventually folded in the, in the late 1920s. This meant that Morris always knew Kelmscott as a working farm, and the influence that this rural farm farming community had upon his artistic and political views was profound. And this image here just shows, shows um, it's just the year after Morris's death, and it shows the farm buildings to the left there still in use. So. so one of our main research priorities, therefore, was to try to find out more about the Turner and the Hobbs families, whose history is so intertwined with that of Kelmscott. So as you see, the Turner and Hobbs were a very large, very prolific family. Using par <laughs> parish records and other sources, we began by creating this family tree which was key to getting to grips with all the individuals, many of whom confusingly shared the same Christian names, so lots of Georges and Thomases. Um, the names in blue indicate the uh, sort of presumed owners of, of the manor there. So when I arrived at Kelmscott, I was handed a copy of the Hobbes Saga. This is a 150-page narrative account of the family, covering the period from around the time of the enclosures in the 1790s through until the end of the 19th century. So this had been written on a typewriter typewriter um, by May, May Elliot Hobbs, who was a member of the family, as Cathy explained earlier, um, and a great friend of May Morris. So the work was a goldmine of information regarding the family and their relationships, farming practices, social life, and occupation of the manor. I digitized it and converted the text to OCR and created an index to help with the research. But fascinating as it was, without adequate referencing, it was impossible to distinguish fact from fiction, and so I couldn't be sure how reliable it was as a um, a record of the life of the family. So accordingly, we visited a number of local archives, 
in search of relevant material, and as the internship progressed, we were fortunate enough to uncover a great deal of the original sources that I believe Elliot herself utilised in, in the Hobbes saga, as well as many other things besides. So, um, among other places, we made a trip here to Burlington House to study the many lead, legal deeds and documents relating to Kelmscott Manor. Here's some interesting facts in the Hobbes saga were corroborated. So this is the will of Charles Turner, who died in 1833, leaving the manor to his son. But it also corroborates the salacious story related by Elliot that Charles had disinherited his daughter Anne after she ran away in the middle of the night to elope with a man he didn't approve of. Although, to be fair, he did later add a codicil, um, leaving her an annuity of £50 a year. <laughs> So to begin with, most of the sources that we consulted were like the will, um, written rather than visual. So we had no way of knowing what the family looked like. But then very late in the internship, I came across these in one of the archives, which turned out to be family photo albums. Um, there are actually many more photos than the ones I've shown here. These are just the ones that were identified in the albums. Um, I was really delighted to discover these because I feel that if they could be incorporated into the display at Count Scott, they could really bring the family to life for the visitors, as, as indeed they did for us. So on the far left are Elizabeth and Anne Turner. They were sisters who were born in the manor in the late um, 18th century, and they were raised there. Um, Anne was the daughter who was disinherited by her father, while Elizabeth was the one who married into the Hobbes family in around 1820. Their brother was James Turner, who is not pictured. He was the last member of the Turner family to live in the manor, but he died without children in 1870, at which point the manor passed to Elizabeth's eldest son, Charles, who's third from the left. Um, Charles, however, was occupied with a farm that had been left to him by his father's family in nearby Maisiehampton, and as he had no inclination to occupy Kelmscott Manor, it was he who decided to lease the property to William Morris. In the meantime, his eldest son, Robert, who's second from the right there with his wife, Fanny, um, he continued to work the farm at Kelmscott, which was in fact one of several that the family owned in the local area. Robert inherited the Kelmscott estate from his father in 1893 and continued leasing it to the Morris family. It was he who eventually sold the manor to Jane Morris in 1913, although he continued working the farm until the 1920s. And May Elliot Hobbs was his daughter-in-law. So, as I mentioned, the Turners and Hobbs were both farming families. And during the internship, we uncovered a great deal of new sources that shed light on the actual farming practices. Mostly the information we found dates from the early 19th century onwards. In terms of analysing this information with regard to the farm buildings that currently farm part of the, uh, form part of the Kelmscott estate, this corresponds approximately to the date that the, the buildings were built. So I don't have time to go through everything that we found, but just to mention a few things. Um, so we came across a number of inventories that provide detailed information of the farming equipment, crops and livestock owned by the family, such as these here. Um, on the left are some dating from between 1917 and 1920, um, while the one on blue paper, and paper in the middle is earlier, dating from 1864. But perhaps more colourful than the dry listing of the in inventories are the descriptive articles that were published on the Hobbes family farm in local newspapers, which kind of gives an indication of how prominent the farm was within the local community. So among other things, the articles describe how the Hobbes family were celebrated breeders of pedigree cattle, sheep, and shire horses. In later years, they also developed a dairy herd. They were particularly renowned for developing the breed of cattle known as the Kelmscott Shorthorn, of which Tricks are there on the left is a fine example. <laughs> They were heavily involved in showing their livestock and regularly won prizes, as the newspaper clippings on the right show. Um, I, I f felt that it was really charming that a, a, a shorthorn was included on the cot cover that, that Cathy spoke of earlier, and I, I think it just shows the kind of connection that, that May had um, you know, to the farm and, and to, the, to the livestock there. So. Many of the sources we came across, especially the legal deeds and documents, made references to the names of local fields um, and areas of land, which at times could get quite confusing. However, the location of these fields was made clearer by the various maps that we uncovered separately, which give the names of these fields, and in some insta instances indicates their ownership status at various points in history. Some of them even give the names of the occupants of the various cottages throughout the village. Um, and I really like these because they remind us that the history of Kelmscott 
the Kelmscott estate kind of goes beyond the bricks and mortar of the actual buildings and into the wider landscape beyond. So another of my favourite finds was these handwritten recipes and remedies, um, which I believe belonged to Elizabeth Turner before she left Kelmscott to marry um, in the early 19th century. So in addition to remedies for the family, there are remedies for livestock too. For example, to treat lower in a cow's foot or to help with lambing ewes. They give an indication of daily life at the manor and show the involvement of the women in the running of the farm, whose role is sometimes perhaps underestimated, although I do think some of the ingredients are perhaps a bit dubious. I don't know how much we want to use lead in our medicines today. Um, okay. So our archive searches also uncovered statement of accounts, notes on experimental fertilisers, bills and receipts relating to the maintenance of the farm buildings, letters, deeds and documents relating to land ownership, and much more. But unfortunately, there's not really time to go through everything here. I was really fascinated by these items, but I believe there's still much work to be done in terms of creating a narrative of the history of Kelmscott Farm, although I think that um, Elliot's Hobbs saga goes some considerable way towards doing this. Um, while researching the Turner and Hobbs families, we also spent time consulting census records, which led me to another of the projects that I worked on whilst at Kelmscott. The census records show not only the members of the family who own the manor, but the live-in servants they employed also. The occupation of the head of the household is stated, which means that in the case of the Turner and Hobbs families, the acreage of the farm they worked and the number of men, women and boys they employed as labourers is likewise given. Like the women, the servants and employees are sometimes underrepresented group, who are nonetheless indispensable to the running of the estate and therefore inextricable from its history. I felt that comparatively little work had been done on this subject at Kelmscott, so I decided to work on compiling a spreadsheet which would bring together in one place everything that is known about the farm workers and the household staff um, employed by the families, the Turners, Mor Hobbs and Morrises, who occupied the manor. So far, the spreadsheet identifies around 30 individuals who over the years were directly associated with, the, with Kelmscott Manor and Farm, plus another 25 or so who were employed by the Hobbs family when they owned the manor but did not live there. The sources for the, this are quite varied, and while some are quite certain, like the census records, others still need to be verified. So with regard to the farm labourers, for example, these newspaper clippings on the right there, um, they name the farmhands who worked for the Turner family and won prizes for ploughing and for sheep shearing. The annual ploughing match is a local tradition that continues in Letchley to this day and actually was taking place the last time that I was at Kelmscott, which is quite nice. Another example comes from the Hobbs saga, which gives delightful anecdotes of all the farm workers and local villagers celebrating the harvest home in a large South Road barn on the Kelmscott estate in the top left there. And it's really lovely to think of this building being at the centre of the community. The saga also mentioned many workers by name, Tom Price, for example, who's in this photo, who was the groom to Charles Hobbs, who leased the manor initially to Morris. Um, it was really charming to discover his photograph just tucked in loosely at the back of the photo albums I showed earlier, which I think sort of indicates the esteem with which he was held by the family. So, the earliest reference to a member of the household staff that I came across so far was in the will of Thomas Turner, dating from 1729, in which he left £30 to his servant Mary Carter, which is quite a sum of money in those days. In another instance, I found a letter in the Kelmscott Manor internal archive sent in the 1970s from a lady now living in Australia telling how her great-grandfather Richard Basson um, was a steward on the estate of James Turner, who was the last of the Turners to occupy the manor before the Morrises. Sometime later, in another archive, I found a statement of account from a solicitor which happened to mention that James Turner, James Turner's man's servant had been in attendance with him and the servant's name was given as Richard Basson, which is quite nice. So, in the 1841 census, we see that the Turner family employed three servants whose names were given as Harriet Farmer, Anne Hicks, and Mary Farmer. The latter two were just 14 years old. The following census records show a similar pattern of employment by the Turners, although the names were always different, so they had a high changeover. The first census taken during the years of the Morris tenancy in the 1870s shows that the Morrises were absent, but records the servants who had been left behind as caretakers. Francis and Mary Harding, and their six-month-old baby, Olive, as well as a 14-year-old maid named Mary Oakley. The following census, in, well, in 1901, confirms the presence in the manner of two servants whose faces are familiar to us, from their inclusion in Marie Stillman's painting, 
um, of the manor, which is now hanging in Jane Morris's bedroom. So that's Emily panting there, feeding the doves, and uh, Henrietta Carter there under the walkway. Um, I've also included this photograph on the top left of William Giles, who was the Morris's gardener. This is a gentleman who inherited William Morris's coat, which is now on display in the manor. I found the photo in the manor archive, together with a letter from his granddaughter explaining the anecdote of the coat. It was when leafing through Olivia's image files of the manor that I saw this other photograph of a gentleman in the garden, which I believe is also William Giles. So the benefit of creating a spreadsheet to bring all this into one place was that we can sort of draw together all these disparate references. And I hope that it will prove to be a useful resource for future interpretation of the sort of life downstairs at Kelmscott Manor. So in conclusion, I really enjoyed my time at Kelmscott and I certainly feel the internship gave me ample opportunity to develop my research skills. Um, the staff and the volunteers were extremely friendly and welcoming and it was a privilege to work alongside people who are so passionate about the land and so engaged with its history. So thank you very much. <coughs>